Thanks. Welcome to the live trading clinic today. My name is Steve Ruffley. We're going to uh, really focus on the Bank of England um, today. Uh, you know, again, as I've always said, over the last kind of six months, that these uh, rate announcements are much more important. Not that I necessarily think that we're uh, you know going to see a rate uh, hike uh, from the Fed or the Bank of England, you know, imminently. But it, it's around the corner. I mean, to be honest. I'm like everyone else in the world. You know, again, I have my opinions. Uh, I'm an intelligent guy. I'm a chief market strategist, trader of 15 years, yada, yada, yada. But I'm not too sure what the Fed are going to do. I've still got an inkling that the Fed are going to raise rates probably just before Christmas. I'm quite cynical in that respect. I think they'll just sneak one in before Christmas, then we'll deal with the consequence in the new year. And whatever happens in the US, you know, the, the Bank of England and the UK are going to have to follow suit eventually. A lot of talk in the market, the Mark Carney is saying they won't raise interest rates till August um, 2016. Absolutely fine. You know, it doesn't really matter, does it? If you've got a mortgage of 25 years, 20 years, 15 years, you know that interest rates are not going to go down any time in the next decade. They're only going to go up. So this is the problem that lies herein. It's not that interest rates are going to go up. We know that. It's when they're going to go up. And then once they do start the, uh, the inevitable hiking cycle, it's how aggressive it's going to be, how long it's going to last for. Again, in my opinion, once we see a rate hike uh, in the U.S., we're not going to see them go down in a, in a decade. You know, we've kept um, interest rates artificially low for the best part of seven years. So that means it's going to be at least seven years, you know, to get them back to normal rates, which, you know, is a, is a challenge. I don't think we'll be able to get raised to 5% in seven years. I just don't think people could handle that. What we've created is this quasi, you know, double, treble, quadruple tiered society where people that bought a house 30 years ago are laughing you know all the baby boomers that are clueless about what's going to happen in the, you know, the next 20 30 years are all sat there with the one two three houses because they've sat on property that's gone up when the average house you know new starter homes uh, that, that david cameron's promised to build are starting in the center you know in the capital of london at 450 and then outside of london 250 okay 450 is still 10 times the average wage so you're talking about people starting life 20, 30 grand in student debt, then expected to get a start home for 450 grand. This doesn't work, does it? It's going to fall over you know, eventually. And as I've said, you know, I've written articles, you can read it, you can search it. In about 20 years' time, there's going to be a major shift in housing, major shift in you know, how people treat, not just treat housing, but you know, the kind of property market in general. Because all I know, because I've got eight parents are all boomers, 10 houses between them. As I've said, I'm going to inherit it all, and I'm going to spend it. Because I've got my own money. I don't care. What do I need with 10 houses? So stick around for that party, guys, because it's going to be absolutely epic. I'll buy everyone who's attending today a Ferrari. How about that? Anyway, back to more serious matters. We're looking at today, not for the interest rate hike. That's obviously not going to come today. Um, what we're looking for is any kind of forward guidance, any kind of comments. Seeing a bit of a strong march in the FTSE. Uh, cable's been pretty good. I still think the pound's going to get to 164 by the end of the year. You know, look at the alternatives. I'm not quite sure why the euro is spiking. Uh, again, it, it's still hovering around dangerous levels for me. I still think parity by the end of the year at one spot zero. Dollar yen is still holding around the kind of 120 mark, but I can see that at 135 when, you know, again, we, we, we know the inevitability, you know, of um, the interest rate hikes are going to come. One bad non-farm payroll does not, you know, really um, dictate what's going to happen with interest rates. You know, at the end of the day, Janet Yellen has said that she's data dependent. So she has to stay data dependent. You know, there comes a point in time where you get so much data that being data dependent is actually irrelevant. Uh, to be honest, she's she's been... Not great, I would say, after Ben Bernanke. Ben Bernanke got out at, top, at the top, you know, like uh, like most kind of great people do, like Tony Blur, you know, like Alex Ferguson. You know, he's left a, a legacy that he saved the world with his quantitative easing. And, you know, at the end of the day, he just said it was a punt. It should work. That was his famous quote. Now, Janet Yellen came in with the task of giving the markets proper forward guidance and not leaving them in, in, in limbo. And that's all she's done. So all we're doing now is speculating that, you know, good data is actually bad data. Bad data might be actually good for the market. And we're in this kind of topsy-turvy cycle now where we'll buy stocks on anything, but then we'll, we'll drop gold on anything. Really, it's very, very difficult to understand, you know, what the market's trying to achieve here. Then at the end of the day, once interest rates go up, people get out of risky investments, which stock gets up. Be even worse because the Chinese uh, are just uh, drones. You know they have no real intelligence for themselves. You know, sorry for any Chinese people listening, but that's that's the fact. When you get relatively intelligent people, which is still thick, 
uh, you know, investors, in my opinion, you know, doctors, dentists, idiots that I deal with on a day-to-day basis with more money than cents, don't know what to do. So when the stock market starts to tumble, they pull their money out because they've already bought low, you know, five, ten years ago anyway. So the market's inevitably going to crash. Sorry, that's the way they go. Markets go up, markets go down. They'll be back up in ten years' time, you know, back around 8,000, whatever. It's all a merry-go-round, isn't it? So anyway, before we get started, there was warning from the spread betting and CFD trading car Halga Show Capital Consulting losses this year's initial deposit. The member tool for everyone to please ensure you fully understand the risk involved. The information and comments provided here under all circumstances and offers to invest, nothing else should be due to investment advice. The information please be accurate, the date is produced. Education only, content on the webinar is the payment of the moderator on the show.com. The, 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 the content is not because you find the rest of tax advice. The trade.com is not subject to liability of the content consumer during the session. So we're going to go over live charting analysis, multiple time frame trading, and really we're going to focus on the Bank of England today. Again, it's not about the rate hike, it's about what's said, what comes through the wires. We've seen these, you know, the Bank of England and the FOMC minutes have moved the market, you know, more, more than the average non-farm payroll. Last non-farm payroll was a, a bit of an anomaly, a lot worse than expected. Markets went aggressively down and then closed higher because bad news is good news. Bad news, less jobs, more likely Fed are to hold off an interest rate, actually good news. So that is the kind of situation we're in. Good is bad, bad is good. We don't really know. Um, I trade a big account. I've got a quarter million pound account. Nobody on, inter- uh, on, on FX Street can touch me. Uh, on, on that respect, I trade real money. I trade thousands of lots a day, and by probably March of next year, my account will be around about 1.2 million quid. So, for free education, you're not getting any better than this. So let's go through the market. It's as I said, you know, the foot's been pretty strong. Had a little sell uh, above this uh, 50% retracement in, in the uh, in the foot earlier on. Nothing really to write home about. Just a bit of a scalp. Uh, again, indices really kind of bouncing off the lows. Uh, you know, DAX hit 10,000 yesterday. Looking to target that again. Uh, S&P, you know, tried to get you know below uh, this nice level at 1980. Uh, I still think 2000 is uh, you know is back on the cards. And while you know, interest rates remain you know, low and the free money's out there, I, I can't really see the indices won't make a new high. I, I, I guess the, the S&P will probably make a new high from this point. Um, dollar yen, as I said, hang, you know, hanging around that 120 mark, uh, I still expect the dollar to bounce. It's the world's currency. It's not going anywhere. I'm selling every high in the euro because the euro, I don't understand why it's spiking in the first place. Um, I guess just value buyers. Pounds look pretty strong. Um, Again, you know, the, the, this, this this nice kind of wave cycle. We see the market go up very much like your your Elliott wave. So you know, one don't retrace much. Biggest wave, don't retrace much. Want to make new highs, so you can look for the three um, ABC retracements. That's that's kind of a nice hourly Elliott wave. Not that I use them much either. I'd rather use Fibonacci. But again, you can see how these things work. You know, it's uh, it, it's always after the event. It's quite nice, of course. You know, strong directional move doesn't retrace to more than fifty percent. You know, again hangs around. Biggest move is the third wave, doesn't retrace much, then goes on to make a new high. So you can say that you know that is a textbook Elliott wave on the hourlies. So I expect that the uh, the pound will go on to make new highs and correct, which might seen as back to one fifty two, uh, and then we'll go up. But I mean, again, if you think that's the absolute high, then use your Fibonacci. So potentially, you know, we don't bounce. Um, if we don't bounce at 23.6 and the 50%, then we're going to definitely go down very aggressively before we see a bounce. But if we bounce off these levels, then it's not an Elliott wave, and uh, then it won't do the ABC correction down to the 50%. Therefore, we're going to make new highs. So I, I still think 164 is a good idea um, to kind of do your long-term um, trades for because uh, essentially I just don't see uh, any alternative to the dollar right now. You know, I'm not going to put it in the Aussie. I'm not going to put it in the euro. I'm not going to put it in the Swiss. So the pound, you know, with interest rates inevitably going to flow um you know the same uh path as the us then you know the pound's got to be a, a good bet hasn't it in the, in the kind of medium to long term uh footsie again coming away from uh from them highs as i said that 50 percent was a nice level here i uh, wasn't prepared to hold it for any length of time uh because obviously we've got the bank of england coming now um bank of England really were focusing on, uh, I guess, the asset purchase facility, 375 billion. Um, we've got unvote, a vote of unchanged of eight of eight to look for any changes of that um, hike, a change of the people of, of actually voting for a hike. And the headline obviously is 0.5, which we're expecting unchanged. Uh, but if we were to see um, a hike for any you know crazy reason, these things have happened in the past, then you're going to see that uh, that pound spike against the dollar. Probably, like I said, you know, a good full point to probably yeah, one, 162, 163. Um, that's very, very, very unlikely to happen today. Uh, but, you know, obviously we're trading, you know, UK data. So have a look at cable, have a look at the FTSE, <coughs> see if there's any filter through to the other currencies. You know, maybe we see a big spike in the um, in cable. We'll see a push up again in the euro dollar. Maybe, you know, some weakness in the uh, dollar yen. Uh, FTSE, I don't know. I don't know really. I mean, historically, 
Um, we do see a bit of action in the FTSE, but it's generally currencies we pay more attention to and bonds. Uh, I don't really trade bonds these days, fixed income. I'm just not that interested. Um, uh, the, you know, the bond and the guilt and that kind of stuff for old school prop traders that, uh, you know, that, that can't change. You know, really, I just focus on what moves. And uh, for me, that's anything from DAX, gold, you know, the S&P to the euro dollar. Uh, the SMI is a good one to trade if you've got big, uh, big size available to you. And then the, uh, you know, the FTSE, again, you know, our home market cable have had varying degrees of success with, with, with cable. So my biggest trades have been in cable, um, but they haven't been my biggest winners. You know, I've had to put a lot of size through um, cable to kind of, you know, hold on to these uh, to these these erratic moves. Uh, but again, when you're talking about trading currencies, you know, $4 trillion is traded. So, you know, with my epoxy quarter of a million, you know, I'm not going to be able to take on the markets, but I can have a good go. You know, I can put a lot of size around. You know, I had uh, you know, 13, uh, 1,300 DAX on uh, over the... Um, IMF comments the other day, so you know I'm I'm fairly willing to you know throw some size around, but again you know my size is, is nothing compared to you know obviously an investment house or you know the, the kind of like big 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 traders out there. So we've just got four minutes or so before the um, interest rate an announcement, and again it's not. Oh, we haven't. Sorry, we've got 19 minutes. Got plenty of time. Sorry, um, we've got um, no real focus on the interest rate itself changing. I think it's all about the rhetoric. It's all about you know any comments that come out, um, any kind of market commentary that comes out. And I think the thing we've got to focus on in our minds is that I think we're still at 46 percent of the Fed, <coughs> excuse me, will raise rates this year. So it's still a 50-50 coin toss, isn't it, really? And let's face it, you know, the U.S. still set the tone for the rest of the world. So if the U.S. starts to move on interest rates, then we know that the U.K. is going to have to do so at some point. So I guess it is the question of do we think the U.S. economy is strong enough to sustain a rate hike? Well, I'd say, you know, with all the quantitative easing, with the seven years, with all the talk, with all the things that are happening globally, if it's not ready for a rate hike, then it never will be. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, a rate hike – uh, for stock markets historically is, is not good, but this might be one of the most dovish uh, re you know, rate hikes in history. You know, again, we've created a world that just didn't exist 20 years ago. We've, you know, we've just created a world of, uh, of printed money, you know, quantitative easing of too big to fail. And that has just created a very, very, very strange um, set of circumstances of which it, we find it very, very difficult to normalize something which was very straightforward back in the day you know you want to control inflation you know you just interest rates you want to make people you know save and you know you know calm the economy down a little bit you put interest rates up that just doesn't happen anymore um we've created it a society based upon absolute greed absolute recklessness too big to fail um it's a scary situation you know people have got used to this new norm where House prices, if your average person, are 10 times you know, the average wage. We've got the 1% that control 50% of the wealth. We've got absolute you know, crazy um, situations in China where you've got more millionaires and billionaires than anywhere else in the world, but you know, about 200 million people that haven't ever used a phone. You know, these kind of differences in income, differences in inequality, you know, history has proven when the, uh, the gap between the rich and the poor gets this wide, bad things happen. At the end of the day, you know, you can be driving around Mayfair in your Ferrari, but, you know, there's a lot of people out there that don't like that and, you know, have nothing to lose and want to kill you for it. Then, you know, what good your money? You know, what are we all going to do? We're all going to sit there and live in, you know, gated communities because that's what I can see happening in London, to be honest. There'll be areas in London where there are no-go. You know, you've got that in America and you'll see it in London where, you know, the gap between the rich and the poor is just wildly out of control. And, you know, you have these rich areas that'll have their own private security firms and poor people won't be able to go in there. And it's that the kind of world we want to live in not really i don't think so so uh i think it gets to a point in everything where you know we have to kind of you know understand and it, it comes down to the politics you know david cameron you know is right to attack the welfare system he got out of control you know you shouldn't encourage people to live uh, on benefits it isn't healthy for people but then you know you can't just cut from the poor and you know do nothing for the rich you know let, let the rich you know off scot-free you know again uh, we've got uh, reports coming out that, you know, something like Google, Apple and Nike uh, owe something like $690 billion in unpaid taxes in the U.S. You know, we just can't continue letting these global uh, corporate firms get away with whatever they want and, you know, just make ordinary people, you know, pay for the super rich. And that's, you know, no matter how you look at it, that's what's happening. You know, Gordon Brown, sorry, Gordon Brown, you know, um, George Osborne and, um, you know, and David Cameron are kind of creating this, central london you know sphere where everybody who's bought houses and votes for them is happy because house prices remain you know very very on the up in london but 
it's creating a barrier to people that you know are up and coming. You know, 20 years ago, you could go to university, you could work hard, you could have the same opportunities as people now. That just doesn't happen now because if you don't want to start your life with 30 grand of debt and you don't have rich parents, then you have to pay for it yourself. And then, you know, what we're having is the baby boomers that had free education, they had, you know, uh, 100%, you know, em employment, they bought houses for next to nothing, everything appreciated over the next 20 years, and they're all set. Well, you can't have everybody in that camp having all the money and all the access to things and then giving young people no ability to carry on. You know, if you're starting your life with debt, your average house is 10 times your, you know, your, um, your, your salary, and you can't buy anything anyway because you can't get a mortgage. Then what, what, what happens to society? You know, what happens with an aging society? You know, it, it starts to fall apart because you're not bringing the earners and the people with aspirations through. And that's happening all over the world. Japan's already reached a point where it cannot sustain um, its, its, its aging population. So the young, up-and-coming people leave because Japan's boring. And they go around the world and they go and do different things. So, you know, all this kind of aging population has got to be backed up by the youngsters. But if you're not giving youngsters anything to strive for, like, you know, the traditional American dream, you know, people living, you know, in shared accommodation until their 30s, not being kids until their 40s, because they can't be bothered. They can't be bothered. You know, what's, what's the point? I can't afford a house, so why, why should I? The whole reason why society's worked, because people had a clear set of instructions. You go to work. You buy a house, you keep working until you retire, pay that house off and you'll be fine. If you stop saying that's available to you know, anybody of future generations, what are they going to do? The opposite. Well, yeah, Alan, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I do get on my high horse. You know, when you're a chief market strategist uh, of my years and you trade you know, for as long as I have, you do get a bit cynical. Unfortunately, it's hard to see the good news for the future generations, isn't it? So, uh, yeah, I'm not trying to put a downer on your day, Alan, but uh, I'm just trying to be truthful here. I'm trying to be truthful. I'm trying to say what everybody thinks, and I'm trying to make you, you know, filter that through to, to the markets. You know, at the end of the day, you know, when the FTSE is going up, it's not, you know, it's not 20-year-olds buying it, is it? It's, you know, it's, it's people with pension funds. It's people, you know, with third property they've cashed in. These are the kind of people that get worried. So you have to understand how they think. And, you know, there's a really good book called The Rough Guide to Trading, yeah, which I've written. And you'll understand how markets work because they're traded by people. You're people. I'm people. I've just met more people than you. I've met more people in the industry. You know, I've managed the biggest trading floor in Europe. I've been around traders pretty much my entire working life. I understand what moves the markets. Yeah, people. So you have to understand what, you know, professional traders, you know, have a view on. And then what the retail traders, you know, that kind of get involved with the fear element, you know, and then all, also in their own way move the market. So... It's all it's all relevant. I mean, I think a lot of people, you know, when I speak to my dad, my dad's in a bubble. You know, he owns his own software company, you know, has 25 guys working for him, bought his house for a quarter of a million quid, you know, 20 years ago and it's worth a million. So he's set, but he has no clue of the real world, how it works. He doesn't interact with it. He goes on the train to London first class, you know, he's got his, you know, seven-bedroom house, you know, blah, 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 blah. But when you speak to him about, you know, normal, you know, living, he doesn't know what, what the price of a cost of milk is. You know, he hasn't gone to a supermarket in, in 10 years. You know, he's not living in the real world. And he's just a bloke, just a normal bloke. And there's loads of people out there that don't have a clue what the what the younger generations are going through. And it's not that we. My point is, you know, if you bear with me, that we're not talking about generations and decades anymore. Okay, you guys have lived through probably the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s. Okay, that's not the same anymore. You will not see defined decades going forward. There won't be these 10-year defined periods in time anymore it's more likely going to be three or five years the pace of change is just speeding up so rapidly that people can't keep up with it i mean think about it. there's been more technological advancements in you know um you know things like you know uh, you know you know drones and you know that, that kind of stuff in the last five years than there has been in the rest of history so think about it in that terms you know snapchat being worth a billion you know i'm i'm a young guy i don't really understand snapchat but it's worth a billion dollars happy days the end of the day is you know, you have to think about what's coming through and the pace of change of how that's coming through and how that's going to affect people's attitudes to investments and attitudes to currency, to the indices, to bonds. At the end of the day, you know, we're in a very, very strange situation that's man-made. You know, seven years of, uh, you know, ultra-low interest rates, encouraging people to borrow, again, recklessly. You know, that wasn't the problem in the first place. So, you know, household debt has come down, but it's still proportional to income, which hasn't gone up. It's still very, very high. So at the end of the day, when interest rates go up, it's affecting everything. Your mortgage payments, your loan payments, your house payments. The reason why the Scottish election voted no. I mean, these why Scotland are idiots, you know. I wish they will go independent and just leave us because they bore me, right? One in four people in Scotland couldn't afford a £50 increase to their mortgage rate. £50. 50. 
50 pounds literally nothing okay one in four people so you go independent scotland you have all that problem with having your own banking system interest rates obviously are going to be affected borrowing rates are going to be more risk Okay, so fifty pound, one in four people can't afford the mortgage payments. What do you think that that level is in England? Okay, how much would it be that an in, in increase in your mortgage of a hundred pounds, two hundred pounds, three hundred pounds? You know, we think about the average house price. People have borrowed a lot of money, and generally people lie and borrow to the top of the range and have debts on top of that. So how much would it have to go up in London? Okay, before people couldn't afford their mortgages? I would say more than a quarter or half point raise in the base rate of interest rates would mean people, yeah, a substantial amount of people couldn't afford their mortgages. Yeah, I mean, I think you're absolutely right, Alan, again. I wish they should about independence. They had the vote. They, you know, they all knew how important it was, and, you know, they, they, they didn't do it. So you can't, you know, you can't have the you know, most historic event in Scottish history. You can't have a rerun because you didn't get the outcome you wanted. At the end of the day, if they'd done it when they said, and, I, and the oil price, as it did, tanked, they would have been finished before they even got started. So I think Scotland really kind of have to you know, be put back in the box, to be honest. You know, if you want to be independent, then you know, we're going to make your life a living hell in the UK because you know, you've had it once and rejected it. If you go again uh, you know, under these new circumstances and this new kind of global climate, then you've only got yourself to blame. So I think <clears throat> what we've got to do is get on with it. The world's a pretty messy place right now, and I think economies of scale and you know, being together is what we've got to do. You know, at the end of the day, I think we have this referendum on the UK you know, remaining in the European Union or not. I think that's going to be the closest one of ever. Um, I think a lot of people with the immigration crisis, you know, with the problems with the Eurozone, you know, bailing out Greece, you know, everyone needs a bailout. You know, where's the UK's bailout? You know, where's our money? Yeah, we haven't needed it. OK, so uh, why should we keep out billing the rest of the world? And I would say that, you know, a lot of people in the UK, I'm not going to say they're all, you know, UKIP voters, you know, far from it. But I think a lot of people want to take some power away from Brussels and put it back to the UK. But it has to be done responsibly. It can't all be about London anymore. It has to be about, you know, the rest of the country. So I think that um, big questions will be asked in that referendum. And I wouldn't be surprised at all if the UK kind of, you know, opted out of uh, the European Union. We're not in the euro. We have our own currency. OK, the Eurozone's still our biggest trading partner, but they're not going to be able to stop that, are they? I mean, the Eurozone's on its arse. They're not going to have to stop you know, doing trade with the UK over um, you know, what we think. So I think uh, there's going to be a lot of changes in the next five years. And as I've said, you know, my point you know, that I've made you know, quite, quite clear is the pace of change is, is different from this old guard. You know, these old, you know, look at the House of Lords. You know, these old duffers. These guys have no clue what's going on these days. You know, they're all getting paid three hundred pound a day to go and sit there and you know talk about nonsense. You know, I, I, I respect it's an old tradition. I respect that it's um, you know part of our heritage and our history. What relevance it has in two thousand and fifteen, I, I don't really know. You know, when there's more people in the House of Lords than the House of Commons doesn't work for me, I'm afraid. We need to really kind of shake up this uh, old view of politics, an old view of how we value society, wealth, um, equality, and, and shake it up. And I don't know who's going to do that. It's not going to be this idiot Corbyn, uh, and it's not going to be David Cameron. So really, yeah, trying to end this doom and gloom, Alan, sorry. <laughs> I don't see, you know, anything kind of, you know, really changing, you know, uh, for, for the younger generation for a long time and it's, I think it's only going to be in the next 15, 20 years when we start to see the end of the baby boomer generation and that money get passed down and the money you know with the money you get the power you know think about Scarface you know first you get the money then you get the power and then that's how it works uh, unfortunately so I would say that really when the money to filter down to this uh, younger generation things will, will change because you just won't think in the same way and I think that'll put a lot of pressure on the politicians and um yeah, there we go. So a lot to think about, guys. So when you say, you know, I've had, you know, these idiot uh, comments in the past. Well, Steve, it's only a quarter, you know, point rise in interest rate. Who cares? Well, I've just told you a million reasons why the, the, the entire global economy cares. It's the biggest decision that, you know, is going to be made in probably three or four generations. Because when interest rates go up in the U.S., it's going to affect everything. It's going to affect everybody. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Bought a house three, you know, three thousand four years ago, uh, and it's six seven hundred. Yeah, ten times earnings here. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally get it. I mean, it, it's not unachievable because a lot of people do get helped out by the parents and that kind of stuff. But who wants a society where you know you, you you're helped out by your parents for everything you do? You know, a lot of people like you know my dad's generation, my parents' generation, they couldn't wait to get to university and get away from the parents. You know, from their old fashioned, you know square way of living etc etc and they wanted to get away but the society gave that opportunity 
opportunity. You had a free chance to go to university and not get yourself in debt. You know, my dad was unemployed when he got his, uh, you know, first house, and that was something like six thousand quid or something. I spent more than that campaign in a month. So you know, it's kind of what are you going to do. You know, what can you do? You can't just tell people, you know, that sorry, sorry guys, you know, sorry, uh, you know, younger generation, all that kind of property is gone because it's owned by you know a large section of this uh, privileged. Um, you know, section of the population, and you know, we're not building any more houses for you. We're not giving you the, the kind of wage rises or even the wages that you want to be able to, you know, afford a, a basic house. You know what? What kind of society is that? I mean, you know, we've gone through massive indu- industrial revolutions. You know, we've built like t- new towns like Milton Keynes in the UK. Why don't we do that? Why don't we, you know, instead of, you know, pumping another two hundred thousand houses into London, which is absolutely pointless and well behind schedule, why don't we build a new city? You know, build a new town, attract people to come out of London. I mean, it's simple supply and demand, isn't it? If you build more, more, more houses, then you know, and demand stays the same. Yeah, price, you know, price of houses is going to go down. Yeah, it's simple supply and demand. I mean, I don't see how the government or anybody can, you know, be so lax on these things. You know, if you want to kind of make it more affordable for people, just build more houses. How, how difficult would it be to build a million houses in the in the, in the UK? It, it'd be easy. It'd be really, re- you know, instead of spending all this money on this HN2 high speed line to shave 30 minutes off Manchester to London, then, you know, build a new town. I don't know, guys. I mean, this work kind of frustrates me because, uh, you know, I, I don't really want to get into the politics side of it, you know, because I'm an economist and I'm, I'm out there, you know, to kind of, you know, tell you guys how to make money. But, you know, as my book, you know, explains, you, know, you have to understand all the workings to fully appreciate the 80 20 rule. That you know markets move 80% of the time technically and 20% of the time fundamentally. So you have to really understand that you know these things are, are, are very, very, very complex. And I think you know I, I, again, I mean, understanding that rate of change is going to be very important in your trading. And you know, then the day I'm not investing, so I don't care where the economy is going to be in five years. I don't care what's going to happen, you know, tomorrow. You know, I just. I just trade, you know, I trade, I buy and I sell, I look for value. That's what I'm always trying to do. My average trade at the minute is between seven and nine minutes, okay? Seven and nine minutes, get involved. That's what we're trying to do, guys. You know, make some money. Anyway, so enough about that doom and gloom. Next generation, they're in trouble, but never mind. As I said, in 20 years' time, they're all going to get that inherited money. So uh, it's not all doom and gloom. All you've got to do, baby, uh, you know, is, is wait for these baby boomers to kind of, you know, end their reign of terror, and the young guys are going to have all the other power and fun. So there we go. Back to today. As I say, we've got three minutes now before the interest rate announcement. I'm expecting unchanged. So uh, unchanged will be the, the call, but it's not about that. It's looking at the... Um, the uh, you know the, any comments that come through, it's looking at the asset purchase, it's looking at all these important things. Yeah, I mean, again, guys, that that's the book, the rough guide to trading. So if you want to kind of have a read of that, that's all my kind of ideas. Um, anybody has bought it, if you follow that link and put me a review on Amazon, again, just be truthful. I'm not asking you to uh, say anything that isn't true. Uh, I'd really appreciate any of your views and, and feedback, and uh, that'd be great. So again, I don't really sell anything on my webinars ever. And I'm not trying to sell you my book. Uh, if anything, I'm just asking for the feedback. Um, all my webinars are free. They will remain free as long as uh, I will keep doing these things. And, again, you don't get many people, you know, that take uh, an hour out of the day to trade these live events with uh, such size as I do. So, uh, again, I'm not blowing my own trumpet, but, you know, I, I do bring a lot to the table to these webinars. And, uh, you know, I appreciate all you guys following me. So we've got two minutes now. So we're expecting unchanged. I want to keep one eye on the asset purchase facility. Also, want to keep one eye on the vote for a hike it's only one okay so 0.5 is the call uh i mean again i'll, I'll say it's a buy or sell based upon sterling uh, cable and uh, if it's an interest rate hike uh, basically empty your account and buy as much pound as you can uh these things have happened in the past guys so anything could happen although it's very unlikely so a minute now guys before the rate decision again i'm ex- Expecting unchanged, but keep an eye on cable because we could see a move. Uh, also keep an eye on the euro dollar because there could be a, you know, a bit of a copycat scenario. And then keep a, an eye on that asset purchase and the, uh, the vote for a hike at one. All right, get ready, guys. Ten seconds. 
So a cable away from the highs. Unchanged. A1 for the vote, A1 for the vote, unchanged. So a little bit of a bid going into cable. Inflation staying below 1%. Watch the pound now. Watch that pound. So these are the comments coming through about uh, inflation. So evidence of productivity is recovering. Limited in some sectors. Seeing weakness in the FTSE. Okay. So comments coming through about inflation, uh, we've seen you know, a, a bit of a downtick in uh, in the pound and then immediately bounce back, back to this uh, key 50% level that I talked about. Uh, a little bit of weakness in the FTSE, I guess, nothing particularly major. So yeah, asset purchase, hold it at 375, 8 one for the vote, uh, which is pretty much unchanged, and then pretty much... I guess the rest of the data is absolutely in line. So uh, very, 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 very uh, in line data. There. So I guess that status quo, I guess that still puts the onus on what the Fed are going to do. But then it also, uh, without you know any kind of change in the data today, all we know about the car is probably August 2016, so that doesn't really look like that's going to be changed. So 2016 is quite a way in the future. So we can see that obviously uh, the pound's going to weaken against the dollar because it's more likely we're going to see a rate hike before uh, the US, as we know. Uh, but I mean, that inevitability, that speculation will drive people to buy the, uh, the dollar over the pound. So a little bit of uh, an up and down movement, really, you know, in the pound, nothing major. Really. Look at the five minute charts. We can see really, you know, we hit uh, 153.15 all the way down to this uh, lower uh, level here at one spot 53.260 and then heading back down. So this is a nice level down here at one spot 52.896. So it could be a little cheeky break selling to that level or I'm potentially more likely to buy because I've got two levels down here. So I'd probably buy a quick movement down here for uh, for, for 20 pips. Uh, FTSE really looked a little bit weak on that data, but nothing major to be honest. Uh, nothing else really moved, as you'd expect, um, as it is UK data. You know, unless you saw a massive move, you know, you might see a ripple through to the euro dollar, uh, potentially a little bit of a movement in the dollar yen. But uh, essentially, pounds not really taken that well, really. I think with the unchanged vote uh, remaining at eight one, and everybody in conclusion that that is that rate hike is probably further away in the future than the market anticipates, and that's why we're seeing this drop in the uh, in the pound now. So no, nothing really to kind of conclusive to, to jump on, really. Inline data is very difficult to trade. When it's out of line, people have opinions. When it's in line, it's open a lot more to speculation. So the speculation uh, is mainly from the big boys. So you're not getting a lot of retail movement in this because what do you do on inline data? If I sold that, I'd be just having a punt, to be honest. I wouldn't really kind of, you know... Um, be interested. Uh, where's gold going? Well, I mean, you've heard all the big boys now say that gold's going to uh, be right about $900 uh, in early kind of 2016. So everybody now is jumping on my bandwagon. You know, I told you in 2013 that gold would get to $1,000 this year. Yeah, and I still believe that. So really what we've got to do is, is really break and hold below 140. And then when we get below 140, you know, they, they spike in the back of the non-farm payrolls. I'm very surprised, you know, because if you think about the indices, the indices went down yeah, like they should do, and then went immediately up. But gold went up and then stayed up yeah, and went on to make new highs. So I think when you look at the monthly charts, you know, we're still very, very bearish. Um, what, you know, again, I'll, let me just, I don't want to just change my charts right now because I'm, I've got too many levels on there. But if I bring gold out, I would just put it on a blank chart. You know, I've shown you this this chart a million times guys you know uh, and i've shown you fibonacci how it works a million times you know from the low to the highs you can see the 50 percent how it's worked i mean it's been a beautiful a beautiful point of attraction you know market eight percent of the time a strong direction move retrace to 50 percent so it does finds really good you know kind of support resistance and decision points rejected 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 38.61.8 is now acting as uh, as, as resistance so a thousand dollars is you know a psychological and technical level, and it's uh, for me absolutely inevitable. You know, lower high, lower high, lower high, close down here, break, 
get through these lows here, then a thousand dollars is is closer than we think. It's only one hundred and thirty, you know, forty three dollars. You know, that can be done in you know a matter of weeks. So a thousand dollars gold's going to get to. Said this, you know, for uh, the last two years. So again, we look at your weeklies. Beautiful chart. Lower high, lower high, lower high. Oh, it's lovely. Oh, love. It. You know, it brings a little smile to my things like this. I mean, look at that. Beautiful. Bailey's. How's that work? That trend line. Lovely. Yeah, staying away from it, making these lower highs. So bang, 61.8 has been perfect resistance. So big, big seller of gold. Yeah, get below 1, 100, and then bang, $1,000 is going to happen sharpish. So uh, yeah, gold can only go down for me. When, when do you see a cash for gold advert on the, on the telly anymore? You don't, okay? All the money's been made in gold. All the hedge funds are out of gold. Money's been made, so it has to go down. Um, What else? Uh, da 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 Good place to buy the dollar Norwegian krona, potentially. Uh, I really don't look at the exotic purse, to be honest. I'll have a quick look for you. Um, dollar Norwegian krona. Don't even don't know about it. Uh, is it. Is it krona, Norwegian? I, I, I really stay away from all these kind of exotic currencies, to be honest. I just, um, I just have no interest in them. I, I trade too big a size to be caught with things like that. I've got the euro knock. Was a dollar knock. Oh, there it is. Well, interesting. So, I, mean, I think the dollar is going to remain strong against most currencies, to be honest, because you know it, it, it's there's the world's currency. You know, with the problems in China, you know, I know the renminbi is very popular now, but you know, China is a communist country and you can't trust them. Uh, you know, we're not going to pile into the euro anytime soon. I don't think that's bottomed out. No, not really getting a lot off uh, off the off the charts that are screaming out to me. To be honest, I would say that you know the recent up move <clears throat> below the fifty percent, big bottoms down here. Uh, I was selling it. I was selling the dollar uh, short term. I think I was selling it back down to here, and then be buying it back probably here and probably around here. So what I'd be looking for is a quick breakdown over the next couple of days, but then use them as buying opportunities for the market to go back up. So um, a bit, what my advice would be, be buying low. That's what I'd look to do. I wouldn't sell it uh, because well, I just wouldn't. But I'd, uh, I'd look to buy it at 794026 and 7 spot 70464. So I'd be looking for them bounces off these levels to go on to make new highs. So um, I wouldn't buy it at these levels personally because I think we've got too much um, – Opportunity to break this, you know, level down here. You know, these these bottoms look quite a quite a target, don't they? We've broken through this nice level of support. We've got this level of traction here. So what I, I probably see is the market move aggressively down here. People are buy it, thinking it's a good bounce. Then institutions push it down another few hundred ticks here, maybe down to here. Then we bounce back up here. So I'd be looking to buy uh, buy breaks of of seven spot nine seven seven zero six seven. Spot seven zero oh, four six four. So buying low would be my call. I wouldn't be buying it uh, yet, though. I'd have to. It'd have to be lower for me to to, to buy. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, let's let's. You know, we can't even trust the data that's coming out of China. You know, we we you know they keep lying. About the you know the, the GDP. I mean, think about China. Have you ever been to China? Okay, it's a weird old place. You've got these mothballed cities. You know, all this growth has come from pretend growth. It isn't real growth. So you know, how how can the renminbi be you know a world currency with somebody you can't trust the data? How can you trade off data that is not true? So it's never going to become, you know, a world reserve currency because how are the hedge funds going to justify buying you know trillions of dollars worth of it when they can't get you know, no data. You know, you can't lie about data in the U.S. You know, or, or the eurozone. It's just too transparent. You know, I'm not saying that the policies aren't, you know, a little bit mischievous. But you know, at the end of the day, when you see some CPI, PPI data, some growth data, you know that it's not a lie. You know, uh, and you just can't say that about China. So I just don't see. It's same with, same argument with bitcoins. Okay, if bitcoins were regulated and a normal entity and were traded by institutions, of course it wouldn't have these crazy moves, and people would be more trusting of it. So what's going to happen is Bitcoin will be around, but it'll cease to exist. And then Goldman Sachs or you know whoever else will bring their own version of electronic currency. It'll be regulated, and then that'll win because that's how it works. Where well, there's money to be made you know, and regulation involved, people would buy it. With something unregulated, people don't buy it because they don't trust it. It's all about trust and you know, fear and greed. That's how markets work. So if you don't trust and you fear what's going to happen in China, then you're not going to stick your uh, hard-earned cash there, are you? 
So I mean, let's face it. You know, I don't think uh, at any any time soon that China, with its you know crashing stock market, mothball cities, and 1.23 billion people doing as they're told until they don't, I don't see how that's a, a good recipe for uh, for for long term stability. <coughs> All right. Well, interesting ish session, I guess, guys. We talked about a lot. Um, again. Pound on the five minutes remaining relatively weak, but I'm a buyer. I'm a buyer of the pound down to 50%. So if we get down to one spot, five, two, eight, nine, one, uh, you know, in, in any kind of quick fashion, we see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine selling candles. You know, alarm bells are ringing, guys. Look for the patterns. Look for the patterns. Yeah, we saw it in the SMI yesterday. 14 um, five-minute selling candles. Hit the bottom. Market's closed. Then we're at 50 ticks up. That's as close as you're going to get to free money. Okay? So start looking now for a buy. But again, don't buy the obvious places. Everyone's going to be buying here because the market's going to smash it down below probably 153. All the institutions then push it down to here. All the big boys will buy here. So before you know it, probably by later on this afternoon, we're trading back here. But all the retail traders have bought here have got smashed out. So it is a buy. But, I mean, again, you know, you're only going to have so many green can uh, red candles before we have to see a green. So look for patterns like that. I mean, it's that's as simplistic as trading can be. All right, guys, like I said, I mean, I'm not pushing the book. Uh, FX Street have actually sent an email out today to everybody uh, promoting my book. So you will get that email from uh, from FX Street. I'm more interested in getting reviews on Amazon. So, again, I'd like to be honest, if you read it and didn't enjoy it, you know, fine, let me know. I'm a big boy. I can take it. But um, honest reviews, please, uh, on Amazon. Uh, anybody who's read it, that would be a big help to me. I don't ask much of you guys um, at all. Uh, but if you'd please help me out and, uh, you know, give me honest reviews, that would be... Uh, that would be very, very useful to me. All right, guys, well, I don't really see a great deal happening. I mean, they, they, you know, I'm going to look for this level to be broken here. And, again, if we get down to these kind of levels pretty quick and get below 153, I'm going to be buying absolutely boatloads of pound. But, again, remember, I'm only buying short term. My trade's, you know, 7 to 10 minutes. So I'm looking for that little bounce of 20, 30 picks on decent size, and I'll be out. So that's what I'd, I'd you know, recommend you guys to look at. Uh, like I said, nine uh, red candles. So on the five minutes, you're going to see a green eventually. But... You know, again, it's one of these things, isn't it? Look for that manipulation. Look for the big boys to kind of draw you in and go, oh, that has to be a bottom. And then they're going to push another 50 ticks so they can bounce it back even harder. Um, well, I start with 30 lots. Uh, I had... 1,300 DAX on the other day. I mean, I'll trade I'll trade anything up to... Anything. I don't really care to. I said anything up to a 2,000 lot position. Uh, like I said, I trade very, very short term. So I'm looking for that short term movement. I'm look, not looking for... Or you know, you know, hundred, two, three, four hundred pip movements. I'm looking for my twenty, thirty pips in and out. So uh, generally, I build a position in over a few prices. Um, my average position, I guess, these days is about two hundred and fifty lots, uh, but then can go up to you know a thousand and above. Um, I mean, I always get filled because I, um, I, I, I uh, you know, I trade at market, so I do get filled. But yeah, I do have a problem with slippage, and I do have a problem getting out of things for profit. So uh, when you trade big, uh, um, big, big size, that's what you got to deal with. I'm afraid. So you know, I, I trade on a spread betting platform like you do, and it's uh, yeah, it's difficult, guys. I do experience a lot of slippage, um, but I, I guess unfortunately, what can you do? All right, guys. Well, listen. Look for this level here. You know, this this is the one we're looking for. You know, we've seen these nine red candles, so I would say probably not a good idea to buy here. Uh, watch it; it'll probably bounce. You know, great off this level. I expect it to break through, uh, and then if it doesn't hit these lower levels, probably buy it again the second time round here. Okay, so let it break through here. It's not going to bounce. I don't think off here. I think it'll break through, hold down here, come back, and then go up. Okay, so look for that. What is the max size? Where well, liquidity is no problem. I mean, generally, for I'd say for me in my experience, is it's around about a hundred lots. Anything over a hundred lots, then you experience you know liquidity problems. Anything under that is not really a problem, to be honest. All right, guys. Well, there we go. Uh, there we go. As I said, not a good place to buy. Not a good place to buy here. Maybe the second time around. So we've seen that pump, pump through this level here. So you know, again, you've got these nice levels here for the market to kind of hunt out down here. And then this is a good level for me. So, yeah, realistically, we go down another 165 pips, or 60 and a half pips. That would be some good good buying down here. All right, well, Matt, we might have to see a bonus trade here, guys. Sorry. 
So just one minute before we get the next five minute candle. So again, what we could potentially see now, we've broken that level, is the market, you know, squeeze down here, then bang, close about here, green candle, and then, then we see our green candle go up. So holding towards the bottom there. So struggling. I mean, again, if we break this lower level, then you, know, you can see here this bottom could be a very, very big target at 152, uh, you know, 982, breaking that 1300 handle. Well, that, sorry, that 5,053, uh, 53 handle. So new low coming in now. You can see everybody's itching to buy, aren't they? Everybody's itching to buy. You can just see that it is pushing down further, you know, getting people out of these long positions. So it's not also how a market gets there. Oh, sorry, when a market gets there. It's how it gets there. You know, the quicker a market moves, the more people are likely to be wrong. You know, when you see these big kind of, you know, jumping movements in the candles i like that because that's people getting big size in and out so oh look at it i mean it just doesn't want to go up yet does it and that's what i'm saying to you, you know it's what you've got to be kind of waiting for that absolute exhaustion point where the market just cannot physically sell off anymore and people buy in and it, it jumps back up Hmm. Interesting. 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 So, I mean, this is where you've got to be patient, guys. You know, everyone's like too frightened to miss it. You know, if you miss it and it goes green and then goes up, you know, whatever. You know, there'll be another opportunity today. What I'm trying to do is, you know, again, teach you how the market views things. So, as I said to you, this was where a lot of retail traders will buy. This is an obvious bounce point. So, what happens? It gets smashed through. And it's smashed through by, you know, 15 ticks. And that's, you know, your 1% of retail traders, their, their risk um, reward is gone. So they're out. They're out of the trade. So the institutions now know that people are long here. So they're going to push it down, maybe push it down a little bit further. And you see these kind of like quick break down to these key levels. And then you might even see a big wick down here. Yeah. Into no man's land. And then it closes. Then all of a sudden, later on this afternoon, bang, it all comes back. So it's all about being ultra patient here, guys. You know, as I said, you know, we've got 10 red candles closing in three minutes and as soon as you see that green one you know it, it is going to shoot up but you know it can it can shoot up then go down then shoot up it's about being right at the right time not under you know not being right on the direction we know that it's going to have to go up, up at some point but what is it going to do it's going to bounce here here or here and that's why i average so i'll build a position if it goes down to here quickly then i'll buy if it goes down to here quickly i'll buy and if it really breaks down i'll keep buying down here because i and no, eventually I have to settle back here and I get out for a scratch or, or probably a profit. Okay, and that's how you, that's how you trade, guys. All right, guys. Well, I mean, I'm not going to sit here, you know, commentating on the uh, on the pound uh, for you. Uh, you know, you can all make your own minds up. And uh, again, like I said, you know, that was a prime example of where people are buy and uh, you know people got get, getting squeezed out. So if the institutions have field has squeezed it long enough now, then we might see this candle close green, the next candle green go up, probably get back to this level here, okay? Alright guys, well listen, anything else, uh, get me on Twitter at Steve Roughly. It's been a pleasure. Uh, expect that email from uh, FX Street regarding the book, and if anyone can help me out with a uh, review on Amazon, that'd be great. Alright guys, thanks for your attendance, and a pleasure as always. Speak to you soon. Thank you.